theoretical ecology. There we go. Um, I, I look to him for guidance in how to think hard and do something with some rigor in this in this field. Um, his uh, PhD is from Italy, but he's been in the United States at Michigan, and then for many years in Chicago at in ecology and evolutionary biology. And I see he's has a has a very broad range of contributions, um, topics from from food webs and. Uh, uh, coexistence, but also questions of scientific publication and funding and so on. You know, again, and you feel like he thinks very broadly and but also thinks very deeply. Um, and so today it's, it's delightful to have him talk to us about some of his, his recent work on, uh, on predicting coexistence, which is uh, something we should all be learning about. Thank you. Thank you, Ned. So, uh... This is going to be a brief presentation. My idea is that if you have questions that like impede like the, the, the continuation of like the talks or so like things that you really need to, to ask in order to understand what's going on, please interrupt me and just ask the question and I'll do my best to answer it. Otherwise, if you want to keep these other questions about like what about this, what about that towards the end, then I have extra slides and other things that I can show you like to answer these questions. And uh, today, like, I, I, I want to talk about this work that we just published like earlier this year with Dan Maynard and Zach Miller on predicting coexistence in experimental communities. Uh, but especially, I would like to stress some of the limitations of this work and some of the challenges that we're facing when dealing with this problem. Uh, and so I'm going to spend like, uh, more time on things that they've done more recently with Polina, with Abby and Carlos. And this new work is supported by the National Science Foundation. Just to give you a sense of what the problem is, uh, we, we can think of the history of ecology and the role that like, experiments played in developing the theory of ecology. And this goes back to Gauss uh, and like, uh, with these experiments on competitive exclusion in paramecium, but also like more recently, we've had great examples in laboratory condition of like chaos in state structure populations, of indirect effects, of ra rapid evolution, of critical bifurcation, and all of these things really like resonate with the theory of ecology. Uh, one uh, feature that all of the experiments that are listed here, uh, you, you know, like uh, share, is that these were experiments where there were very few species uh, uh, interacting, either one species or two species or a maximum of three species or three stages. And the problem is that to answer other questions in ecology, we need to really experiment with larger systems. And with larger, I mean with several species uh, interacting with each other. Uh, uh, this is essential to, to answer some of like, the most important questions that we have in, in the theory and in the practice of ecology. For example, the relationship between biodiversity and say stability or productivity or invisibility. And this has been a focus of several people for several decades, but also questions relating to how much of a deterministic skeleton do ecological systems have versus stochasticity, or how can we go and assemble or even control ecological communities, and even like purely theoretical questions. How come it is so hard to find like strong signature of chaos in large ecological systems? And people have tried this type of experiments. In fact, like some of these, these experiments are the largest uh, ever conducted in ecology, like the Cedar Creek Biodiversity 2 experiment is like the closest that we had to the large hydro collider in ecology. And this is an experiment that went on for several decades, trying to grow different species of plants together and seeing how do these impact, like this diversity impact productivity. The problem of experimenting with, uh, uh, with larger communities, like there are several problems, but I would like to stress two of them, one of which is fairly obvious, which is there is a very large number of assemblages that I can make when I have a handful of species. For example, if I have here, you know, five species, I can grow each species separately and I have like uh, five uh, uh, options and then I can grow them in pairs and I have 10 options or in triplets and I have 10 options and then in quadruplets and I have five options or I can grow them all together. If you sum all these numbers, of course, they're two to the n minus one. Right, which is okay to do with five, like we get 31 experiments because we don't really care about like the one where there's no species <laughs> to begin with because then we know the answer. But, uh, but, but then if we have 10, we have a thousand experiments. If we have 20, we have a million experiments. So it becomes harder and harder to choose among this wealth of experiments that we could do. 
which one should we do to understand the community of the lake as best as we can. So that's problem number one. Problem number two, well, well let's, let's just say a few words about problem number one, just to say that this is an actual problem. For example, in these biodiverse flu experiments that I showed you, people chose out of a pool of 18 species, you know, and they planted in each plot either one, two, four, eight, or 16 species. But if you take like two to the 18, it's a very large number, right? It's more than a quarter of a million experiments and you can choose only 168. And these 168 actually include replicates because maybe you want to grow the same combination twice or three times to see whether it goes always to the same place. Similarly, uh, you know, Mark Adot did this other experiment with 17 species and there we have 131,000 possibilities and only 100 plots. And uh, Bell et al. that used bacterial strain, they, they selected 72. And with typical like British humor, say they, they, they say that it's logistically impractical to try all the possible combinations that are 10 to the 21st. So, so we're getting closer and closer to Avogadro's numbers. And in fact, like if you have like 100 or 150 species, you have more combinations than there are atoms in the universe. So if you're the graduate student that to do them all, you're in for a trip. All right, so that's the first problem. It's like there's very, very many combinations and we can only possibly explore a few of them. And we try to understand the whole system looking only at a few. The second problem has to do with ecological dynamics. When we put together a bunch of species, there's no guarantee that all of them will coexist happily ever after. And in fact, in many cases, we expect some of these species to rapidly go extinct. And as such, like our configuration that we started with ends up being completely different from our end point of the dynamics, right? And maybe uh, one experiment where we had like three species ends up being basically a replicate of an experiment with two species or one species because of this extinction. And again, these are uh, really practical issues that happen all the time. So in this biodiversity two experiment, in 2015, 72 percent of the plots that were initialized in the early 2000s with the species had lost at least one species. And in fact, all the highly specious plots, right, with eight or 16 plants, had lost at least one of their members due to extinctions. And similarly, like I like this quote from Mark Adot, that says several of the four species plots became three species plots, and several of the two species plots became monocultures with only one species. Right, just to say that we have these two problems. One is like we have to select uh, across like this very large number of combinations. And second, there's no guarantees that these combinations, what we put in is what we get out. Right, so if you're the experimentalist over the sea of fog, right, you're, you're there scratching your head on which experiment should we do to maximize the amount of information we can get out of these experiments and try to understand as best as we can the system. What you would really like is to have a method, some sort of disciplined way to navigate the large spaces that, that are given by these possible assemblages that you can put together. And also like predict whether these assemblages will lead to coexistence or not. And possibly have some sort of iterative design such that you can do a bunch of experiments, update your predictions of what's gonna to happen to all the other combinations and then select based on this information, right? So that would make for a Bayesian in a way a, a frame. Now, this, I'm not the first person to, to think of this problem. And in fact, this is a very long tradition in ecology, especially in the area of population dynamics. And the typical approach, the traditional approach you would take is to fit time series. Right? And this is very common in ecology because like if I have a lake, you know, that it's like close to, to, to my office and I want to sample phytoplankton, what I do is like I go there every week and, and you know, like I, I take my phytoplankton and then I count the cells and then I do a time series of this through the year maybe to show like a seasonal fluctuations or things like that. And, and this, if I can fit like time series to uh, these experiments, imagine that they put two species together, or three species together, and then they track the dynamics. Then I can parameterize models, dynamical models with these. And then if I, to do this, of course, I need to first track the population dynamics, which is not that trivial. And second, postulate a dynamical model that sort of makes sense for, for, for the time series that I have. But then if I have all these parameters and these, these equations, I can extrapolate. Right, and predict novel assemblages based on the fit that they have had for a few assemblages. And the pros, of course, is that this is a very well-studied problem. 
there are many approaches that either use maximum likelihood or base. And especially, I can use all of the data. Like even if species go extinct, the rate at which they go extinct, tell me something about the parameters of this model. The, the, the cons are, of course, that I need to know uh, precisely, as, as best as I can, a, an appropriate dynamical model that can fit these equations. And also, of course, this is very expensive. Imagine that I'm doing this sampling by, say, sequencing, then I have to sequence very, very many samples. It's time consuming otherwise, right, where I have to go in the field and count and sort this biomass or, or, or these individuals uh, very many times. Now, people do these time series. Uh, so here I'm showing like an example from Venturelli's lab in Wisconsin, where, where they culture together different strains of bacteria. And here I'm showing just a few of the many experiments that they did in which they grew together pairs of, of, of bacterial species. And on the y-axis here, you find the relative abundance. So this is the proportion of each population in, in the time series. And then they sample this basically every day. A, or maybe twice a day a, for, for a week or, or so, right? And here is the first part of, of, the, of the time series. And what you can see here is that there are three replicates. These are the different dashed lines, right? So solid or dashed or dotted. A, and these are started from very different initial conditions. So in one case, they're started at about 50% each, high and low, low and high, right? So, so just to probe, where is the system going when we start at different initial conditions, which is a way to think of like the global attractiveness of some attractor or, or, or whatnot. And, and what you can see from these time series is that they're fairly consistent, right? So each one of these time series tends to go about in the same place, which is a, a good point because then it means that dynamics are not that complicated. There's very limited evidence for like strong bi-stability in which, you know, I could have species A high and B low or B high and A low. And, and the other thing is that dynamics really happen very much in the first part of the time series. So for example, if you see like the top panel, like after a, basically two days, all the things that had to happen have happened. So that means that like sampling these other points after two days is not that informative of the parameters or the dynamics. And this is true, for example, also in this panel that says 528. This is basically a number that says the composition of, of, of the species, right? So this is the type of experiment I'm thinking about, right? Where you're in your laboratory or in your like a controlled environment of some kind. And now you can take a pool of species and try to grow each one in isolation, in pair, in triplets and whatnot. All right, so compared to the traditional approach, I would like to, to take like some sort of radical deviation from this time series fitting. And what I would like to propose is a purely statistical approach that is completely agnostic on population dynamics, which, which is very like uh, different from what, the, what I really like as a person, <laughs> like as a scientist, right? I love population dynamics. So, so we're gonna get rid of population dynamics. And in fact, we're gonna base our method on a single measurement for each experiment. So instead of like sampling the whole time series, imagine that I just wait for three and a half days and I sample the last point. And that's all I have. And so this is gonna be a very cheap way to, to, to measure these interactions and, and try to predict the existence because we just take a system, we initialize them with some initial condition and then at the very end of the experiment, we just sample all the points. And this is gonna end up being a Bayesian framework where, where we can do this iterative design, right? Where we make predictions, we do new experiments based on the predictions, and then we go back and, and we update our experiment. And, and just like to, to show you like practically how this would work is you conduct these experiments by starting, you know, like different assemblages. So for example, here we start like two uh, time series with the same like initial uh, uh, species, right, these green species, and here we have two replicates of like only orange, and here we put purple and green together, etc. And then we don't really observe these dynamics going through time, but imagine that we go at the very end of time, right, at, at this point here, and we record the densities in each experiment, and then we collect these densities that we call the endpoints of the dynamics into a matrix, right, and this matrix will have as many columns as there are species in our pool, and then each row is one experiment, right? So in this first experiment, there was only species one, so we put like whatever was the density of species one here, and then zero and zero, all right? 
So we collect these endpoints, and now we're going to use this matrix of endpoints to try to probe like the interactions between the species and predict dynamics and predict coexistence, not really dynamics. And to do this, we just take the simplest possible model that you can think of, which is a, a, an additive linear pairwise model. Let's say simply that the, the density of species i in experiment k, right? This is what is on the left hand side here. Is what? It's just like some sort of baseline uh, density of species i, which we would obtain basically if species i were to be growing alone. So you can think of this as a carrying capacity. Uh, and this uh, initial density is modified by all the other species that are in experiment k that survive, right? This j species times some sort of modifier, right? So you can think of like this xi bar in experiment k as the true or ideal uh, abundance of species i in these uh, experiments, right? Where, where it coexists with a bunch of other species. And then this gamma would be a carrying capacity and this tau ij would be some sort of interaction. Now, uh, because I like matrices, we can turn this into a, a matrix problem by just like uh, we, we put like gamma on the other side, divide both sides by gamma. Uh, and what we end up with is like this equation where this vij is, are the coefficients of a matrix V, right? And then we're summing over all the j's in k uh, and, and this, the left-hand side is just a constant, minus one, right? So that tells you that if you knew B, finding what is the best possible uh, x, j in experiment k would amount to fitting a linear regression, right? So, so if this matrix is square, you can just invert it and put it on the other side, and now you get uh, your prediction for, for uh, x, j, k. The problem is we do not really know b, right? So, so like this whole method will be given this model, we want to find this matrix b, and this matrix b has n squared coefficients, where n is the size of our field. So how do we do this practically? You remember that we have this matrix of endpoints right here that we can call, for example, E. And now imagine of taking a submatrix, and this submatrix we call, for example, E1. And this E1 is the submatrix of E when species one is present. So you can see that the first column here is completely filled. And now we can write these equations based on our model. For example, we can say, uh, you know, X species one in experiment circle times b11 must be equal to minus one, right? And this would be the equation corresponding to this uh, row of the matrix. And then, for example, for experiment diamond here, we could say, well, uh, x1 in experiment diamond uh, times b1, b11 plus the, the density of, of species three, I think it is species three, in experiment diamond times b13, has to be equal to minus one, right? That would be this equation. What is interesting about these equations is that whenever we have more than one species, we can actually write as many equations as there are species, right? Because here we can write a, a, an equation for the row like uh, i of, of the matrix, but then you can imagine we could write another equation that says uh, x1 in experiment diamond times b13, b31 plus uh, x3 in experiment diamond times b3 also has to be minus one. So, so we can recycle basically these uh, experiments and in fact they will appear, uh, for example, the experiment with the three species together, right, will appear both in E1, in E2, and in E3, right? So, so it allows us to write three equations for one experiment only. Now, uh, I know how to solve this system of equation. Of course, like these are rectangular metrics. In general, there will be no single uh, solution that fulfills like, these constraints. But I can take the best fitting uh, uh, solution for, for the row of V, V1, right? Uh, and I can do just taking the pseudo inverse exactly as you would uh, in, a, in a linear regression, right? So that would give me the best uh, estimate for V1, 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 V1. And then I can basically repeat these for each uh, species, and each one uh, of these system of equations will give me one row of B, right? So provided that I have enough data, and now I get to what that means, I can uh, parameterize this matrix B. And as we will see in a moment, having B, we can predict all the other configurations that we didn't try. Uh, let, let's just say a few words about what kind of data do I need. Of course, I need enough like endpoints, like in the sense that there must be enough points, like the enough measurements, enough experiments, but also that they need to be sufficiently diverse, 
right? And in particular, you can imagine that I have to form all these little matrices, right? One for each species that are here. All of these have to be full column rank, right? Which means that each species must appear in at least n distinct experiments, and each pair of species, for example, must be present in coexisting in at least one experiment, right? This is the very minimal notion of having all these matrices of rank n. And then, as I said before, look at the, for example, the experiments with the triangle appear in the first set of equations, in the second set of equations, in the third set of equations. So endpoints where we have k species coexisting, they allow me to write k equations. And this is actually very interesting from the point of view of experimental design. So imagine that now we have a pool of species, we have, I don't know, these isolates of bacteria in our freezer, and we want to do a number of experiments to determine all the coefficients of these. Based on this very simple idea that we will see later, it's not the greatest idea, it's really a naive approach, hence the title. But what, what we need to do is to be able to write n squared equations, right? One for each coefficient. And then we have these constraints that each species must be represented in n endpoints and each pair must coexist somewhere. So the typical design that people do, uh, experimentalists do, is what I would call a bottom-up design. So for example, we can grow each one of our n species in isolation, and then form all the n choose two pairs, and then grow the pairs together, right? So the monocultures, the ones with only one uh, 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 species per experiment, will give me one equation each, all right, so here we have one equation per, per experiment. And then the pairs will give me two equations, right? Because I can write one equation for i and one equation for j. So doing these experiments, right, we get n parameters from the monocultures, n times n choose two minus one a, a equations from the pairs. And if you sum, you get n squared, right? So if we do experiments and all the pairs uh, coexist, right, such that we can write two equations for each, then this solves the problem of parameterizing b. And the number of experiments we're doing grows basically with n squared divided by two, right? Because we're limited by these pairs, like n to two. Now imagine that we're in this very benign case in which all the assemblages coexist, right? So that's like the ideal case. At that point, we could do one experiment putting all the species together. And because we can recycle these n times, we can write n, n equation with a single experiment. And then we could do all the leave one out communities, which would be, you know, I do a, all the species besides A, all the species besides B. And if each one of these leave one out community also exists, each one of these experiments will allow me to write N minus one equations, right? So now if you sum these numbers, we have N plus N minus times N minus one. So we get again N squared, but we only perform N plus one experiment, right? So going from the top down, it's much more economical in a way than going from the bottom up, right? Because we can parameterize these with the order of n experiments instead of order of n squared. Of course, these two designs are terrible, exactly as in you would not want to do a linear regression with all the numbers like bunched up on the x axis, right? You would like them to spread a little bit such that you're predicting out of fit maybe, but not out of range. So the possibly the best design really is to mix these two, right? To do a bit of the bottom up, a bit of the top down, and then combine them together in this approach. And numerically, like to do simulations, you find that in fact, this is really like the best design is to start from both ends, right? The, the, the experiments with few species will give you high biomass, if you think. The experiments with many species will give you low biomass for each species. And then by interpolating between these two, you can basically predict in the middle quite well. So this is like a message that is quite general on experimental design. Now, imagine that we parameterize B, we're left with the problem of predicting out of it whether a certain assemblage of species will coexist or not in our experiment. And uh, this turns out to be uh, fairly easy to do, like, because as we said before, right, uh, when I have like my matrix B, I can take a subset of, of B, a submatrix, by taking all the rows and columns in the assemblage that I'm interested in, right? So imagine that I'm interested in the first three species, so I would take the first three row, first three columns, and that's my DK, invert it, multiply, they take the negative row sums, really, and, and now I get a prediction for X at K. 
there are basically two cases. The first case is all of these numbers are positive that I predict, which is good, right? Because species can, you know, be at some sort of positive densities. And so these, we could say, they could coexist potentially, right? Like, of course, it's not sufficient to determine coexistence, but at least it's necessary, right? At least under some models. And then if some of these numbers are negative, we cannot really have minus five zebras. So, so we will discard this point saying they cannot coexist. And the inspiration for this really comes from population dynamics. So if you write like the Lotka Volterra model, like this is like a hundred years old model this year, actually. And if you just like, uh, this is like, you know, on the left hand side, you have like the typical way this is written, divide everything by R, right? So now you get one plus this matrix P. This matrix P plays exactly the same role as the matrix B that I've shown you before, right? So this matrix B encodes all the possible equilibria of the system. And in Lotka Volterra, we know that to have coexistence, even through like chaotic dynamics or limit cycles or whatnot, we need to have a feasible equilibrium somewhere in the positive orthant. It does not need to be stable, right? That's like why this is necessary, but not sufficient, but it is necessary, right? So in that case, we would find the right answer. And in fact, by parameterizing like simulations based on Lotka Volterra using this scheme, even this naive scheme that I showed you before, we would do a perfect job, right? We would uh, recover exactly like our matrix B and therefore exactly all the equilibria in the system, like the two to the N minus one equilibria, whether they exist or not in the system. However, you can just like extend this to any model with any dynamics. And in fact, our model we tried on data that does not abide by lots of Volterra. And therefore, I would say that our model is completely agnostic on the dynamics, hence like the very statistical interpretation of these coefficients, right? So they, you should not interpret them directly as in interactions because that would only be true for lots of them. All right, so I showed you this very naive, like simple model based on linear regression. Of course, it's totally wrong, right? And it's totally wrong because it does not really account for, for the error structure in the model. So, so when I write like equations that I say, you know, like for example, d times uh, x is equal to minus one. If I'm doing a linear regression, what I'm assuming is that there's some sort of error that is on the minus one, <laughs> but that's not where the error is, right? We all know that the error, in fact, is in the x, right? That we're measuring this x not precisely, not at equilibrium, not, a, a, you know, like a, when the dynamics, the transient dynamics have elapsed, and as such, this cannot be the place where we want to put the error. Moreover, because we're recycling the same endpoints over and over again, right? And we're fitting each one independently. Even if we're thinking of a linear regression with errors in measurement, we would need to force the errors to be the same across all the times that we use the same point. It has to have the same error, right? You cannot change error because we're fitting another row of the metric. So what we're gonna do is something that is very similar. It's a little more computationally expensive, and that could be an issue when we're trying to do like large uh, communities, but it's much more robust and it allows you much more freedom on choosing the error structure that you like. So in practice, what we're gonna do is something uh, trivial really. Like what, what we take as an input is just these metrics of empirically measured endpoints. And then we take some sort of prior distribution on the coefficient bij and you can put an in, uninformative prior, whatever you prefer. And, and then the algorithm is very simple. We sample a matrix B by sampling all the coefficients from their priors. We compute what the matrix E would be under these coefficients, right? And call that E, e tilde. And now we can score the, the sample of B tilde or equivalently like the E tilde by just taking some sort of metric. And the two obvious choices would be some sort of sum of squares, right? How far are we from the observed values, right? Squared. Or, and this is really like saying that the error that we believe it's some sort of instrumental error, just like that we're measuring these biomass, but we're not measuring it precisely. Or if we're thinking something like that could compound because we're really measuring like this thing while it's still growing or things like that, maybe we want to take like the log of EIJ and then the log of, of our prediction, provided that it's positive, you cannot take the log of a negative number and then do this, right? Just to show, that you can choose different error structures or even more complicated error structures and it's the same framework and in the end you just accept or reject this b based on their the sum of squares 
and then you do MCMC, and if you do it for long enough, this will converge to some distribution of these, right? So, so what we get in the end is really a distribution of the matrices, and by doing the distribution of the matrices, then we can compute the probability, for example, these two species coexist. They don't need to uh, coexist for all of the matrices in our posterior, maybe they only do it sometimes. We could interpret this as like the probability that these two species or these uh, ensemble species will coexist, all right? Now, this is all very good, but of course, like you have to test with actual data. And it's surprisingly difficult to find like uh, experiments that have been carried out just because this obsession with the experimental design on singles and pairs, right? And this problem of like this combinatorial explosion, it's actually quite difficult to find papers where people have done enough experiments and observed a diverse enough set uh, of species uh, to fit, to test the model. But we found like three uh, of them that use different uh, organisms. So I'm gonna just show you one of these results on plants. So these are like four plants. And in fact, there's two sets of four plants, four native plants or four uh, uh, non-native plants. And these have grown in all possible combinations besides one, right? So, so there's gonna be 15, uh, uh, 14 actually experiments because one of them, they didn't have enough seeds and these are grown in greenhouses. So it's a very controlled experiment. But just to show you like the, what the results look like, this would be the fit uh, of the model. So you see like these are basically little box plots showing like the confidence uh, or the credible intervals for, for, for like the abundance of each species in each experiment. And you can see that there's a very strong uh, like uh, fit to, to the actual data. More importantly, what we can do is to exclude some experiments. For example, here we exclude the experiment where a species green is grown by itself. And there's like several replicates, there's 10 replicates of each. And then we fit the model without this data, and then we try to predict these out of fit. So these are out of fit predictions, and you can see that not only we get the central tendency quite well, but we also get the spread of these points quite well, even for like experiments with all the four species together. And this is basically what happens also for the other data sets. Of course, this is like the one that abides the most to, to the structure of the model, and also there's like 10 replicates of each experiment, so it's a really ideal data, and I'm very grateful that people publish this study. All right, and I can show you more data, but I will not because of what I would like to do is to concentrate on the problems with this approach, right? And if you're a theoretician like I am, immediately your mind goes to, this is too much of a simple model, right? That we should change the structure of this model. But as I want to convince you, there are other problems that are probably even worse that we need to solve before we can play with the structure of the model. The first problem that we had is that often, especially when we're dealing with bacteria or like other microorganisms that we can score by, by looking at their uh, sequencing data, uh, what, what we end up with are relative abundances and not absolute abundances. So like this thing that I showed you before assumes that this Xi in experiment K is really like a, the absolute abundance uh, of this thing. When we're observing just the relative, imagine like Yi is just like this divided by the total biomass in the experiment K, then we end up with the equations that now have more uh, unknowns than we had before, right? Because we don't even know the totals. And of course, in this case, like all the monocultures will yield 100% of one species, which is not very useful to, to fit the data. Uh, and turns out that you can use basically the same approach with one caveat. The caveat is that when we're trying to fit this model, we always have a nullity that cannot be compressed, right? Like, so we always have some parameters that will be unknown. And in fact, there's gonna be N plus one of them. And what you can do is to set these parameters arbitrarily, right? So you can take this matrix and set N plus one parameters to the numbers that you like the best. And these will define like one matrix out of a class of matrices that give you exactly the same species abundance distribution for all the possible combinations. What this means practically is that if before we had trouble interpreting B as some sort of interaction besides the famous case of Lotka Volterra, now this B does not mean anything biologically, right? Like because we can take infinitely many matrices that give us exactly the same fit to the data and they're all different, all right? What is very interesting though, that it's like some silver lining of this, this approach, is that possibly fitting relative species abundance could be better in certain cases than fitting total abundances. 
And this has to do with like block effects to some extent. Imagine that like in this experiment, they put them like closer to the sun, like or in a like more sunny area. Like the whole uh, like uh, experiment was in a base, like that was closer to a sunny area, or was warmer, or I put like more fertilizer. What they would have is that all these errors between the the, the measurements would be correlated, and by taking the relative abundance, I get rid of this type of errors, right? So so to some extent, I could end up fitting the data better when I use relative than when I use a total amount. But just to give you an example of like the lack of interpretability of these metrics, these two matrices here that look nothing like each other, especially look at the third uh, uh, column, right here we have all positive numbers, here we have mixed signs. These two matrices that look nothing like each other give you exactly the same relative abundance for all the experiments that you can perform, right? And so, so that tells you that while you can find a, a matrix, in fact, infinitely many that give you very, very good fit to the data, you cannot really interpret these coefficients. And this is actually something that is of interest to like ecologists today. And there was like only a few weeks ago, a nice paper in Plus Biology on Lotka Volterra using relative abundances and what can you say, what can, can, cannot say in that case. Right, so that's challenge one, which is solvable, right? Like you just need to be a little more careful with your linear algebra. Challenge two, as a theoretician, I have more trouble uh, uh, solving. Uh, and really, like the Achilles heel of this method is that it assumes that the data makes sense. And by saying makes sense, species that should go extinct, they are extinct, right? So if I have two species and I say they coexist, they should coexist. It's not that like we're in the transients and these species is slowly going extinct and the other one is slowly taking over. And then I fit that, no, because now I'm trying to find a, a matrices in which these two species robustly coexist, right? Well, that's not the case. So this becomes a problem when you have multiple species, especially when you have bacteria, and especially when you're doing like scoring of these bacteria using some sequence data by doing OTU cowling, right? So, so you're trying to find which a sequence is similar to the sequence they sample. And, and just to show you like an example of this, again from the Venturelli data that I mentioned before, they did also very large experiments in which they have uh, 11 strains, right? So, so they have 12 in total and they take one out, right? And then they do this leave one out community. And then at the end they sequence like the community that supposedly has a maximum of 11 strains. And then they score them against like this OTU table. And from there they get the relative abundance. So these, for example, are the experiments in which BU is excluded, right? So in theory, these numbers should be zero. In practice, because of either contamination or more probable uh, OTU calling, I have this, this BU strain is at 2.2% density. The problem with that is that all these species, right, half of the community is at the density that is lowered of 2.2%. So are these all extinct? Or are they like uh, hovering close to zero, but they're not quite zero? Uh, is 239 uh, really different from 2.2% or 2.8%? Is it really different from two? Uh, uh, so like, while I can rest assured that these three or maybe four species are really robustly coexisting with each other, for the rest, I don't really know. But if I put in the wrong information into the model, I will certainly get something that is really, really wrong when I try to predict out of it. So this is a bit of an issue. And, and the way I'm thinking yet, like I haven't really uh, tried this practically, of solving this is a more computationally expensive uh, approach in which you could say I have an observation, right? Imagine that I'm growing two species together. And now instead of scoring them like against only the, the, the configuration in which both of them coexist, I could compute the distance with all the possible like sub experiments that I can do. For example, where only species A coexist or only species B uh, remains there and the other one is extinct, right? And so by taking like the sum squares to all the possible uh, two to the K, you know, like points that could be formed using this experiment with these initial conditions. Now I can both call which endpoint am I talking about and fit the data at the same time. Right, so this will of course require a lot more MCMC time, especially because basically you end up having to compute all the possible subsets of all the possible experiments before you can score uh, this uh, solution. Now, 
this like problem of spurious correlation, I think it's very, very hard. Another very hard problem is what if you don't have enough data, right? And you typically don't. In fact, that's why it was so hard to find a, like good examples to, to use for, for our paper. In practice, like if you're not really like uh, trying to uh, have an experimental design that is geared toward fitting this, especially this model or something very similar, then you typically end up with like a diversity or a number of endpoints that are insufficient to fit all the n square parameters. So, so what you need to really do is just to dramatically reduce the number of parameters in the model. And if you're a statistician or if you're like into machine learning, immediately you're thinking, well, I want to find a B matrix that is sparse, right? Like do some sort of regularized or penalized regression in which I either penalize for the number of parameters, the, their magnitude or some other uh, structure. Because I'm a biologist, I would really like to favor a biologically inspired solution. And I think we have information that we can supplement to this type of uh, experiments. And the most obvious choice is really phylogical, right? So, so we know that all species on Earth are intimately related to each other through this evolutionary history. And nowadays, we can really build trees for almost any ensemble of species that we can think of. And so if you have a tree, and especially if we have what is called an ultrametric tree, right? That would be a tree in which all the branches, right? This is the beginning of time and this is today. All the branches sum to one, you know, like the right hand side, like the, it's one. So if you have a tree structure, right? With all these parameters, alpha, beta, and gamma, and now you take what is called the various covariance matrix. So imagine like the, these three, you could think of like traits like for, for species. And then you take like this trait matrix time is transposed. Now you have a various covariance matrix. And this various covariance matrix can be expressed in the case of an ultrametric tree, right, with n minus one uh, parameters, right? You just need like the, the splitting point. Now what you could say is my matrix B right, the one that I use to call the endpoints is a function of this sigma t, which is the various covariance matrix of the tree. And so, for example, if you say it's just this matrix multiplied right and left by, by two vectors, right, which would make for a very ecological interpretable model, you end up with a model that has three n minus one uh, parameters, which is much, much better than n squared when n is sufficiently large. So this is actually uh, what was funded under this uh, grant that, that, that I showed initially. So it's active work. Turns out these models are not that easy to fit. Like there is some sort of like subtlety uh, uh, and it's very difficult, especially to find maximum likelihood estimates of all these parameters. So that's like, if you have suggestions, I would be happy uh, to hear them. And now finally, you know, like as good theoretician, we can get to the problem of model structure. And here we can, go from a linear regression to something more complicated, for example, a polynomial regression, which would be equivalent to saying there are higher order interactions. And I know that some of you are interested in this. Mathematically, it gets a little tricky to then call what are my predictions, because in theory, this can have a number of, of different uh, equilibria, right, or, or endpoints. All right. Finally, when will this fail also? It's when we have lack of coexistence, so we don't have enough data, of course. So this is possibly based for like things where interactions are not that strong for each other, with each other. And for example, we can never fit a food chain, right? Because we will never observe like the predator without the prey or the top predator with the intermediate species. Whenever we have strong multi-stability, right? We are assuming that there's gonna be just one endpoint for each experiment. If, we, if there is multi-stability, what we're doing is taking some sort of weighted average, which might not be the, a good solution. And then finally, when there are stronger, uh, higher order interaction, then our pairwise model will fail. And similarly, like strong non-linearity would amount to basically the same. But in summary, just like a very simple statistical framework to, uh, to try to navigate this space uh, of endpoints. Very good out of fit predictions for experimental data. I just show you one slide. I have more if you're interested. And what is interesting is when you do like simulations, you can also simulate highly nonlinear models. But we, what we are end up with is a, some sort of reasonable fit and some reasonable a calling of coexistence, even out of fit. And, and what the, I think it's the most important point is that really suggest a radically different way to do experimental design, right? So rather than concentrating only on the 
bottom up, like starting with one species at a time and then go two, three, four, five species at a time, where the number of experiments explodes immediately, we can attack this problem from the top and the bottom at the same time. And now we're in a much better place to try to predict what's going to happen in the middle, which is where the bite of communities are. And as I try to convince you, these you can extend in a number of ways. And I just show you some of the directions that we've been taking. I would be happy to discuss a more a, a, a way to, to extend or to improve this approach. And I just wanted to thank you. And these are like the three papers uh, of the people that graciously made their data available, allowing us to, to feed the data. Thank you. Thank you. I will.